this is Venice, as you can tell, and Renaissance Venice in particular. The Venetian Republic was a force to be reckoned with at the time, and they employed soldiers from what we would now call Croatia, and those soldiers improbably uh, gave Europe one of its most memorable sword types, an example of which we're going to look at today. Here's the seat of power for Venice uh, at the time, so yeah, they were rich and powerful, and they could afford good soldiers. The soldiers we're talking about popularized this sword here. Uh, I've heard this pronounced different ways. Uh, Shiovona, I've heard sword makers call it that in videos, uh, but it seems to be with a K sound. Schiovona, or something like that, uh, as one Italian master on YouTube said. But anyway, it's a very famous sword type. These are broadswords. They're basket-hilt broadswords, but a particular twist that is instantly recognizable because of the guard and pommel, as you're going to see. So, But first, here's an end-to-end -end view of one, an antique, and not the one that we're going to see in detail in this video. Let's talk about the users. You know, I said Croatia, but really it would have been called this region, Dalmatia. You can see Dalmatia on the map here, right by the word Republic. So now it's a region of Croatia. It's on the Adriatic, as you can see. And you can see how it would have fallen within Venice's sphere of influence, right? Venice was a strong naval power. Anyway, at the time, Dalmatia was its own uh, place and people, its own language. In the classical era, it was a province of Rome, so it had long ties to Italy. Dalmatia is a coastal area, so it's not surprising that it came up on Italy's radar early on, right? It's on the coast, not very far away at all. And here is part of Dalmatia, and if it looks familiar to you, it's probably because it was used in the show Game of Thrones. So anyway, Venice hired mercenary soldiers from this region and found them quite useful. I know this picture quality is terrible, but it's the only representation I could find of what a typical Dalmatian soldier might look like later in history, as you can tell. This might help in that regard as well. Here's a picture from well over a hundred years ago, and it gives you a sense of kind of the old world Dalmatia at least a little bit, so the soldiers might have looked something like this. These are obviously, you know, some of their descendants. And in a similar vein, I thought... Maybe I can find a picture, and I did, but it was not easy. <laughs> find a picture of some dowdy Dalmatian youths from as long ago as possible. And here you go. So this probably is a pretty good indication of what the young men going over to serve in Venice might have looked like, uh, not costume-wise, but in terms of physical characteristics. Back to the sword, then. It's surprising that a you know an implement used by imported mercenary soldiers would catch on the way that the Schiavona did, but it became popular with aristocrats, it was used on foot, on horse. It became a fashionable sword from a fashionable city, and its influence spread to other areas and other armies that had commerce with Italy, and especially Venice. And that's why you can see kind of real working man models like the one that I'm going to hold. Uh, you'll see is, you know, fairly simple. It's beautiful, but fairly simple. And then you'll see these real ornate versions as well. This one here is notable, this picture, because it's a saber style blade. It is all about the guard and the pommel when it comes to the Schiavona. Once you know it, you'll always recognize it. It's called a, informally, called a cat's head pommel. Look how gorgeous that one is. You can see the iron bars on this guard don't offer as much protection as some of the others we've seen. You know, that development increased over time. And that's part of the entire basket hilt lineage and evolution. Venice at the time uh, that all this was happening was ruled by the Council of Ten. So here's a painting of them. And uh, yeah, the Dalmatian soldiers uh, caught on so much that they were used as essentially royal guards. Even though this was not a monarchy, you know what I mean. The Doge of Venice, so basically the chief magistrate, uh, yeah, used them as guards, and I think that gave them obviously a lot of visibility, gave the sword a lot of visibility. Here's an end-to-end -end view of the one that I got to examine, and I'll be back uh, once that's done.
you could see there, that was a fighting blade, right? That was not one that was meant to just be worn uh, and seen. Here are a few more examples. In regards to its fighting uses, I mentioned that it was used on foot and on horse. It became uh, especially popular with heavy cavalry, and you can see why, right? It's a broadsword. It's a very sturdy blade. Here's a different kind of Schiavona, and this is relevant. Bear with me. So here's a work by Titian. I also like just squeezing in great art whenever I can in these videos. And no, there's no sword in here, but the subject here, she was called, you know, La Schiavona. And we haven't talked about the etymology of the word for the sword yet, right? So it seems to mean someone of Slavic descent. And back then, Schiavona seemed to refer to a woman of Slavic descent. And, you know, the soldiers that popularized these swords came from the Balkans. The name of the sword then appears to be tied to the region from which they came, but then in particular to the feminine. So it's kind of like calling a boat or a sword, you know, a woman. In other words, this is kind of like, possibly, what's happened here is it's kind of like if a sword from Spain became really popular in another country where they speak a different language, and the sword became known as you know, La Señora or Señorita. Others say that the name regards specifically the hired soldier aspect. The feminine ending of the word uh, lends weight to the former theory, in my opinion. Here's the telltale hilt from a different view. Let's get back to a little bit of the origin history. Uh, the Schiavona developed in the latter half of the 16th century. Most sources agree that basket-hilted swords uh, started in Germany, and from there spun off many famous descendants, like the Scottish basket-hilt broadsword and the Schiavona, also the English mortuary sword. That being said, some say that a Turkish Ottoman influence was actually the genesis of uh, the Schiavona design. Now, back to the fighting aspect. Uh, on foot, this was commonly used with a buckler. Here's an Italian swordmaster whose video you can check out. He doesn't do any demonstrations, he just, he just talks, uh, and in Italian. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, you can see him with the combination of buckler and schivona. Speaking of use, here are some fun experiments uh, with a modern recreation on the show Forged in Fire. I'm glad they didn't uh, neglect the punching aspect. You know, it might not seem like that big of a deal, right, with armed combat. But if you're fighting an armored opponent and all you can get off is a punch, uh, then a knuckle bow or especially an elaborate handguard like this uh, can be a real lifesaver. No, it's not going to knock out someone who's in a steel helmet, but it could ring their bell, discombobulate them a little bit, make them lose their balance, uh, you know, interrupt the flow of what they were about to do. Again, like I said, could be a literal lifesaver. Uh, one final view and a different view of the nice rugged guard that this one in particular features. I really like it. Uh, Workman-like sword, this one here, uh, but still visually impressive, as all Skivonas are, which, of course, is probably a big reason that they caught on. I mean, they're functional, but I think the visual appeal was a crucial ingredient in their adoption, uh, and that adoption lasted all the way until the Napoleonic era. Here's a couple of details from the blade, and I will leave you with that. Thanks a lot.